on um, crypto in general, uh, but this year I really want to talk about Bitcoin, so that's why I'm wearing the Bitcoin hat. Um, yeah, it's a, a bit about me. So I'm, I've been in Bitcoin since 2010, uh, active in the Bitcoin Ethereum ecosystem. I know the price is not really like top right now, but for me, I don't care about price. I don't trade. I'm doing that for the tech and just like, I think it's a great time to get into Bitcoin right now if you're interested in tech because there's an emergence of Meta protocol on Bitcoin. I'm going to talk about that today. Uh, nothing about price, nothing about all of that thing. Um, yeah, I traded the first Bitcoin IRC, uh, and right now I'm really excited about Bitcoin all over again. Uh, Ethereum, it's kind of like, it's still there, it's still kind of like number one place to build stuff on if you are interested in crypto, but Bitcoin's getting fun again. So, as I was preparing for this talk, I was going through some of the old things that I, that I have, right? So, uh, this is uh, kind of like a mining thing that I did back in 2012. So, this is my account, uh, there's no name there, but this is my account. Uh, it's blanking out the address for obvious reasons. So uh, I was doing one Bitcoin per day. I'm not here to show off, just saying that it's been there for a long time. Just wanted to also kind of like give you a thought as well that um, and this is back in 2011, 2012, so December and then over to January. So I was doing one Bitcoin per day. So if you look at this, take a guess on what machine I was mining on for Bitcoin back in those days. What's that? Raspberry Pi. <laughs> I don't think you can mine a Raspberry Pi. It's past that already. Uh, do I have a farm and all that? Um, yeah, so you can have, so Bitcoin's mining started with CPU and then GPU and then FPGA and then now it's all ASIC, right? So you don't do any of those anymore and it's not profitable. In fact, when on ASIC, it's, it's going to be really dumb of you if you start to mine yourself because the Chinese that manufactures all these ASIC, they're gonna sell you the older generation, the new generation, they're gonna mine the hell out of it. So the one that you buy from them is the older generation. So you're gonna be losing against them anyway. So it makes no sense for anyone to mine, unless you want to manufacture it yourself. So this is what I was mining only for GPUs. <laughs> yeah, I was back in my, my guest room and I was mining uh, one Bitcoin per day on this four thing. I, don't think it was profitable. Even though it's one Bitcoin, it costs a lot now, but I don't think it's profitable. But it's good enough for me to learn and really get interested in Bitcoin. Um, just in 2011, I started mining. So I started, to, started getting into Bitcoin from uh, 2010. Yeah, so like, I didn't even know how to like, do an open shelf and all that back then, because like, I don't want to have like, gathering dust and all that. So I was using a regular um, like a, uh, stand to do all of that, but right now you have had those racks that you have it completely open. You can have like four carts in each uh, in each machine, but back then I was like doing two carts on each machine, and the last one was like kind of like acting like a router and doing the Ethernet over to these uh, to these machines. So uh, in the end, I actually have these hosted on data center in Singapore. And back in 2011, data centers do not charge based on electricity consumption, only based on bandwidth. So yeah, so I was actually paying less than probably what I consume, <laughs> so they were losing money. Uh, yep. And this is my first talk in Geekcam, August 2012. Um, the topic of my talk is how Bitcoin was safer than your bank, and last year about how cryptography makes Bitcoin also safe. And during my talk, the price of Bitcoin was $15. Today, I think that's uh, at least a thousand times or like 1,500 times more than that. Uh, obviously, I don't really know the price that much because I don't trade as much. Um, seven, is it? 26,000. 20, yeah, less than 30. Yeah, less than 30. Yeah. Yeah, 20 something thousand. Yes. Yeah, so it's $15. Uh, yeah, just about 10 years ago. So, yeah, super interesting. Um, uh, so, if you're in a space in Bitcoin, you probably heard about ordinals, and uh, this is what has been filling up the blocks for, I think, start of the year. Um, if you're not so much into the tech side of things, you might dismiss it because yes, just another NFTs that's now sitting on chain and because on Ethereum side, you have NFTs as if you're linked to an external linked uh, image, but on Bitcoin side, it's actually sitting on chain. Let me push it aside so that I don't block the screen. Yeah, it's sitting on chain. So you might dismiss it as just yet another NFT and just like not interesting. But, but it is interesting, not only for the fact that it is actually embedded on chain itself. Um, I'm going to get a bit more details on that. So also the t-shirt I'm wearing here is I'm involved in the site. Um, 
I'm kind of like the architect uh, of the protocol goes behind that, that goes behind odds are. Uh, it's kind of like a centralized trading of ordinals. Yeah, it's all NFTs and all that. Uh, also, fun fact, I'm not interested in NFT. I'm not interested in the images and all that. I'm interested in the tech behind it. So I actually don't own any ordinals myself, except just a few for me to test it. So yeah, odds are, if you check it out, oddsar.com, uh, yeah, that's what we do. And it's a decentralized um, trading of ordinals where you don't actually have to give up your ordinals to, to trade. You actually sign a... Uh, partially signed Bitcoin transaction PSBT to trade. So basically saying that I want to sell my Satoshi or Arnold's for a certain price and you just sign it and you put it on the site. Someone wants to buy it, will then complete the transaction and then you have a actual swap that happens uh, on chain. So at no point you have to give up your Arnold's on the site. So this is what's happening. I'm not going to talk so much into that detail. But I want to largely talk about the Meta protocol. Right? So this is what's happening as well. That's why today I was actually Initially, we would not be able to make it because I was supposed to be here, and then there's a change of plan, so my team actually went there, and now I'm uh, here uh, giving talk on oil and steel. So a bit of a history on Bitcoin. I mean, a lot. if you're in the crypto, you're into blockchain, you're going to be do, doing a lot of buildings on Ethereum. So naturally, if you're not, in, if you're not sure about the history, so why, why don't people build on Bitcoin? Because... Bitcoin is just money. Like you don't really build on money, you build around money. So what it means is that it's like it's like fintech of today, right? You don't build on USD, you don't build on 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 currency, you build around currency. So you build payments, you build wallets, you build all these like rails and all that to to facilitate money. So you build APIs, you build services around around money. So you don't you can't build anything on Bitcoin because there's no there's no smart contracts, there's no cool things, there's no Turing complete instructions that they can do anything on it. So, so, and the thing that came around back then was like you build services around it. So you build exchanges, you build like uh, uh, marketplaces around it. And um, like blockchain wasn't even a, a, a word uh, back when all these around, what was around. So people are just building services around money and not on top of it. And more, like you build casinos and you build things on top of that. And then the probably fair casino is actually a very, very interesting one where if you go to a casino, if you play online casino especially, like you don't know how, you don't know if the casinos are playing against you. Let's say you roll a, a dice or you, you play a slot, for instance. Like how do you know that it's fair? So the way they know it's fair, obviously you can do it off chain where you can just have a hash that the, compute, the computer result is already pre-computed. So you bet, let's say a roulette, so there's a pre-computed result. So you have a hash that's already published. Publish and then you place your bet and once it's done, you reveal the, the, the payload that makes up the hash, therefore you know that the results are really predetermined before you even place the bet. So therefore, the site cannot cheat against you. But all of that is done off-chain though, so it's not fully on Bitcoin uh, itself. So it's off-chain, but it's probably fair. So you kind of, kind of have this concept where you can bet against the house. So the house here has edge, obviously, but they're not cheating against you. So you know for sure that that's the case. And this is one of the first things that really filled up the blocks. Before, before Satoshi Dice came around, I'm going to explain a bit on Satoshi Dice. Before Satoshi Dice came around, Bitcoin transaction was practically free. You can send any, anyone in the world with a minimal fee that, that's like the, you can set a default fee. If you run a minor, you can set the lowest fee that you would accept to transact a Bitcoin transaction. So, so the lowest, I don't, know, I, I don't know what it is, but it's almost free. So, but when this came around, the blocks started to start to fill up because Satoshi dies is where you send a fixed address amount of money. So there's like different addresses that you can send. So this one, you have a 25% chance of winning. This one, you have 50% chance of winning. This one, you have 99% chance of winning. So there's all these different, uh, you have 1% chance of winning. So obviously, you know how the math works. So you do, if you send a 1% one, you're going to get like a close to 100 multiples of your money back if you win. If you send a 99% one, you're going to get like, and like one, um, most of the time, you're going to get just your... 1% back or something like that. So that's how it works. So, but it's all probably fair. So the randomness of that is based on the previous couple of blocks of hashes that you hash together and that makes up the, the answer for that. So I know why people play that. I, I, I wasn't interested in it at all. I didn't play it. But if you look at the block explorer back then, that was 2012, I think, it was all filled up with Satoshi dice. I know why people are playing it, but I think they're just part of a money laundering, right? So you just play, you can play a 99% chance of winning, and then you just 
kind of clean up your money that way. So that's kind of what it is. So Bitcoin was kind of like dirty back then. I mean, yeah. So that's when I gave talk in 2012. So it was filled. It was a keynote talk. It was completely filled. I mean, that was probably the first time a lot of people were hearing about Bitcoin back then. So um, people were naturally curious. So, so what happened now with Bitcoin that suddenly there's a lot more interest in building things on Bitcoin again. Did something happen on Bitcoin? I mean, Bitcoin is known to be really slow in innovation for, for good reasons, because Bitcoin is meant to be money and money meant to be more, more, more fixed. You don't have a lot of innovation that's happening with that. There are probably like maybe like three key upgrades that happened in Bitcoin for the last 10 years, whereas compared to Ethereum, you probably have like 50 different key innovations happened in the last eight years. So on Bitcoin side, any major upgrades on Bitcoin, there are like a few, like very few. And these are very, very minor upgrades, not really like major. Smart contract support, none. So there's still no smart contract support on Bitcoin. So what really happened, how, how all these things really happened, is actually Bitcoin is white space. So if you think about white space, you can fill it with anything. It's, this, it's basically this OP return. So it's just like your programming thing where you have return and then after that you can fill it any garbage in there and it's gonna be ignored, right? Because they return return from the function. So on Bitcoin, there's an op, there's an op code, operation code. It's kind of like a, your, your assembly uh, code, but it, it's not Turing complete. So it doesn't have an infinite loop. It doesn't have, it doesn't even have loop. You can have like, you can write linear, uh, but it's very limited space you can do with it. But the cool thing is that it has return. So after return, you can fill in whatever, whatever you want with it. So the, the primary purpose of the script on Bitcoin is for you to solve puzzle to prove that you actually own the Bitcoin that you spend. So if, you set, if, you, if I uh, send someone a Bitcoin, uh, I need to prove that I'm the owner of the wallet or the address that I being able to sign. So I need to solve this puzzle. And the puzzle that I solve, is, it's, it's part of this whole script. At the end of it, there's a return. If it returns true, then I'm able to send. If it returns false, then I'm not able to send. So, but after that, there's still space that you can fill stuff with it. So the white space is where people are starting to build stuff on that. So the first thing that happened was in uh, 2014, I think, or 2013, something called colored coin. So colored coin is being filled on the OP return part of the Bitcoin. So it's basically just white space, right? So the Bitcoin miners and the ones who really processes the Bitcoin consensus do not care about what's happening behind it because they're just comments. They're just return stuff. They, they don't care. But there's a client that parses things after that to know what to do with it. So one of it is called Colored Coin. It's actually one of the author was actually Vitaly Buterin, um, which is the author of Ethereum later on, but he was actually built on Bitcoin earlier as well. So he's the one that started um, colored coin and how this works is that there's another client so so you build tokens on bitcoin so bitcoin has no token that's only bitcoin that's it so so what color coin allow you to do this back in 2016 is that i can create a new token that says i know like call it a sgd for instance sgd token that's and and then i can just mint let's say i'm the creator i can mint sgd obviously i have to back some somehow but assuming all of that, put, put all that aside. So I create an SGD. I can then send this token to you using a color point protocol. And if you use a white space protocol, it just means that if I send, if I have five SGD and I send you four, you have to know that I have that balance. If I send six, that is still a valid Bitcoin transaction because Bitcoin doesn't care because it's just comments after that. So how do you know that I'm actually able to send the amount of money that, I, that I'm able to, to send? So you need another client that parses all of that. So if you, yeah, I'm gonna get a bit more details into all of that. So just a bit of history, color coin. And then if you're in a crypto, you know about Tether, this is US, also known as USDT. It's kind of the single most important token, I would say after Bitcoin and Ether today, where uh, almost all the trading's happen on USDT or USDC. And they're all now uh, Ethereum tokens or ERC20 commonly known as ERC20. Uh, but does anyone know that before Tether was ERC20, it was actually a Omni token on Bitcoin? This was in 2014. So I think it was last as a Bitcoin token for about two years and then got overtaken by ERC20. So Tether was actually a Bitcoin token, token of Bitcoin blockchain. I just hope that you don't confuse it with like Bitcoin itself. So Bitcoin has a native token called Bitcoin. 
So the network and the token has the same name. And that one has a consensus. So if I have five Bitcoin, I cannot send 5.1 because that will not be a valid transaction. But if it's a token, it's just using a white space. So Bitcoin miners doesn't care. So you need to use the client to parse whether are you able to send it or not. So Tesla was that back then. It was using Omni protocol on Bitcoin blockchain. And it kind of, it, it kind of take off a little bit, but not too much um, because Bitcoin was hard to use. And Tether at that time didn't make a lot of sense, even for me as well. I was in blockchain for a long time. I was in today's term known, known as maximalist, but I'm, I don't subscribe to the, to kind of like the maximalist thinking that the general social media people call Bitcoin maximalist because of the laser eyes and I'm not those kinds. But I'm, I understand, I, for me, I believe in the, the, core, the, the core philosophy of, of blockchain on Bitcoin. And I don't see a need for any other blockchain because you can build everything on Bitcoin and then obviously Ethereum, but now like, there's, done, there's no need for anything else. So Tesla was on Bitcoin for a while and then came Ethereum. So Ethereum is such a big thing. This was 2014. It was such a big thing. It's literally a world computer. That was the, that was the tagline for Ethereum when it first started by, by Vitalik. They no longer use this tagline because it's too geeky. It's very hard for anyone to, to comprehend. But the cool thing about Ethereum is that firstly, for the first time, it has a Turing complete instruction set that you can build anything you want on a blockchain and it's all consensus, which means that you can put a, you can put a game on it and um, it will run, but obviously it's gonna be really expensive because each instruction will cost money, uh, cost real world money to, to run. But the, the cool thing about Ethereum is that it's a global single computer where the states are all the same globally. So it's not like how many nodes you run, you will have multiple like network effects. It's just one single computer. So no matter like you have one node or like a million nodes, it's still one computer. So it's still one computer. So it's programmable. You can have it's doing complete instruction sets, open execution, which, which, which means that if you see a source code somewhere, you know what goes in the machine. So there's something that before Ethereum came around, like you can't really prove that because even if you have open source software, you don't know that the same software is running on the, on the machine that you are, let's say you have a voting software that's completely open source and you go to a voting counter and you vote and it's counted by the machine. You don't know if the same software is running on the machine because you cannot see inside the machine that's running the same software. So, but with Ethereum, you know because it has an open execution. So you know for a fact that it's running the same software that's being, um, uh, that's put in there. And the Thomas City, so if you have a bunch of transactions that goes into a Ethereum transaction and all that has to go through, if one of them fails, all of them will just reject itself. So these are cool things that happened on Ethereum in 2014. For geeks like me who like to program stuff, it's such a world changing thing and naturally everyone moves into, moves into Ethereum because it's so fun to build. Um, it takes the world a little bit more to kind of pick up, uh, but the thing that really take off for Ethereum, I think, it's the ERC20 standards that it's kind of like we all take it for granted today, but it's a standard that was not there when Ethereum came around. It's basically just, Ethereum is basically just a um, program. Like what you know as smart contract today, it's just a fancy term for, for program, right? Open, open program. So tokens are actually just states in a, in a program. So you, let's say you have SGD, um, um, smart contracts and you basically just store like this account has this amount of SGD token, this amount has this amount of SGD token, and someone sends, you're gonna deduct from this account and you add to the other one. It's basically just that, it's all just states. So before ERC20 came around, there's so many different ways to write that because you can have different variable names, you can have different ways to store your token balances and, this, and it's hard to build a wallet that kind of abstracts the token to what it is today. It, I, it still amazed me on how the whole thing is abstracted so well today that you don't even know that it's actually those tokens are not even real tokens, it's just a state in a, in, in a, in a, machine, in a program. So ERC20 kind of standardized all of that. And so I took Tether, uh, so they launched in, I think 2014, I think they started to move over to Ethereum in about 2016, I think. So they moved over to ERC20 and then kind of like completely taken over on the Ethereum side and then they discontinued the, um, the Bitcoin uh, token. So all that kind of set the states about what I'm gonna get into. Um, so Ethereum, once Ethereum came around, everyone leaves, all the builders in the crypto space and blockchain space kind of leave Bitcoin for Ethereum because it makes no sense to build on Bitcoin where you're just building 
uh, tech around the, te the, the, the blockchain because you can build anything in the blockchain itself, whereas on Ethereum, you can actually build on blockchain itself. So, uh, Tether stops upon a Bitcoin layer, citing lack of demand, and uh, this was, uh, yeah, actually only in 2023, they already completely stopped it, but they kind of like, um, already, this is because like, it's not really being used anymore, so that's why they announced a uh, full uh, stop. If you have like a Tether on the Bitcoin side, you go to a Tether um, a company and try to redeem your dollar for that, they're gonna say, no, we don't, we don't recognize that anymore. Um, so what is Ethereum came prove that actually you can now build on blockchain. It's not only built around blockchain, you can actually build on blockchain. So you have a consensus on blockchain you can now build on. So this is kind of what uh, the uh, kind of crypto community calls it like a builder culture, right? It's a misspelling of build, but basically it's builder culture. So there's so many protocols, so many decentralized apps, so many standards, there's so many uh, interoperability across dApps, and ERC20, as, as I said, it wasn't really a standard when it first came around, but eventually kind of like graduated due to like demand and due to like crowd um, kind of like gathering around it and it became a standard. And I, this is part of the thing where we're seeing Bitcoin in Bitcoin today, where we have so many different competing standards on all these protocols that have been on, on, on Bitcoin. I'm gonna share a bit, a bit of that, but I'm just sharing from my, uh, from my uh, observation, where it's similar to the early days of Ethereum, where you have a lot of competing standards building things around it, like NFT wasn't even a standard back then. You have so many different ways to build NFT, and uh, eventually one, there will be one that kind of wins and then become the standard. So, like, but the, cool, the, the, the key important thing is permissionless. So anyone can start a standard, and if you start a standard, you're gonna talk about it, you're gonna promote it, you're gonna try to build stuff around it, you're gonna get more other sites to build around it as well. So this is what's happening on Bitcoin today. And um, yeah, on Bitcoin side, it started with ordinals. Ordinals, again, is, it's a way to embed. Um, okay, so if you, I, I didn't cover that on this talk, but just a bit of a background on ordinals. So ordinals, the term itself, is you know math, right? Ordinals just mean that first, second, third, fourth, and all that. So ordinals, it's not a Bitcoin thing. It's basically just a guy, his name is Casey Rod Armour. He just kind of, thought it's fun to other, so every Bitcoin has one to the part, one E, eight, um, eight decimal places of um, Satoshis, which is the smallest number of Bitcoin. So, so, um, so what this guy did was that, let's order every single Satoshi from the first one being mine all the way to the, to the current one being mine. Let's start from number one all the way to how many million that we have right now. And then we just trade. So every Satoshi is gonna be treated differently because there's a number now rather than just uh, being totally fungible. So ordinals is just a way to kind of order all these Satoshi in a non-fungible way. So he created that scheme, but it didn't, it didn't really take off because no one really cared. It, it created, I think, for about a year ago. And then earlier this year, in January, he started to have a way to inscribe. Inscribe meaning embed uh, data or file on the Bitcoin blockchain itself. And that really takes off because people can now put like JPEGs on it and starting to have more stuff to, to build around it. And uh, it really took off in a big way. So in March, um, the, the Bitcoin block started to be filled with ornos. And this kind of creates like a war between the, the more fundamental Bitcoin uh, people where they said that Bitcoin should not be used for anything else except for transactional Bitcoin. And then the other side where say, it's a free and open database. You can fill it with anything you want as long as you pay for that. Because all those people do pay for that. Right? Why, why can't they use it? It's a permissionless white space. So as long as you pay for it, then, then it's fine. So this one is still like Ornos right now. Ornos, it's a standard because it's created by a guy and it's kind of take off. So everyone has to adopt that standard. But then it's very limited because the guy did not plan so far for it to be taken off. It's just a fun project that he did on his own. And now we want to build stuff around that. And then there's so many competing standards, for instance, like ordinals, unlike Ethereum, where you can have a hierarchy of smart contracts. So someone has to have a way to do that. And there's so many different competing ways of, of doing that. And there's no right or wrong. So other sites, other marketplaces will pick up different ways to do it. And it kind of feels like Ethereum. And, and, and I feel that it's a good sign that this thing is taken off. So Bitcoin build culture is taken off because I mean, it feels like a mess right now, but this mess will eventually graduate into something that becomes a standard uh, soon, right? So, similarly for on-chain metadata. So, this is something that I proposed uh, on, a, on a proposal as I wrote that. Uh, 
and this is the, the this is the creator of of uh, Ornos. So I wrote that kind of like how to embed the metadata on Ornos without breaking it based on the negative test that the guy actually has on the Ornos client. And and the funny thing is he actually came to Singapore and I talked to him. And that was like the day before he came that he broke my proposal because he kind of like changed the negative test into something else. So the, the behavior of negative, negative tests that I rely on to embed uh, metadata into, into uh, Ordinal, because Ordinal, like if, if it's a JPEG, you want to have some metadata. For instance, like you want to embed how rare this, this uh, JPEG is, you want to embed like, like you know, traits and all that. So you want to embed on metadata itself on the on Ordinals. But in order for me to do it safely, I need to rely on something that I know will not break. So I rely on negative tests on the client itself, but eventually he broke it. So I was like talking to him, it's like, why did you break it? It's like, yeah, whatever, I can do whatever I want, right? So it's my, it's my protocol. So, <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what it is right now. Uh, so, I mean, it still works. It will, still, it will render somewhat differently on, on some of the client, but it still works. So we're gonna also, I mean, for my team, we're gonna adopt to the new standard I mean, because the, the core protocol updated to a new one. So it now has a metadata standard. So we're gonna, we're gonna change that. I mean, um, this is what's happening on Bitcoin. So there's so many different competing standards today and it will gradually gravitate towards the, the standards. So something I also wanna point out is that even if it gravitates towards something that a lot of people start to use, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the best. So, so on the ordinal side, Ordinals is created as a non-fungible layer on a fungible layer. So Bitcoin is fungible, and then you have Ordinals layer that's non-fungible. And what someone came up with is actually BRC20. So this is a play of word from ERC20 on Ethereum side. So someone came up with a name called BRC20 Bitcoin. I forgot what RC is, BRC20. So it's, it's a really shitty protocol. Uh, even the guy who created it says that it's a shitty protocol. Don't use it. Uh, there's not use something else, it's just a fun project they created. So it's just started this thing that you create fung fungible token on top of non-fungible layer that sits on Bitcoin, which is fungible layer. It's a really shitty protocol. It's, it's so bad that it's really, really hard to build on and you have to re rely on many layers of external indexer to know whether it's your token, uh, token balance is right or not. And there's no way to validate it yourself. So they actually built a consortium of kind of like core nodes that you validate against to see if your balance that you, you pass it on your side, whether it's correct or not. So it actually goes against the whole ethos of blockchain because you have to validate against a centralized service to know whether it's correct or not. It's such a bad design protocol. Um, but it takes off in a big way. So after this thing came out, all of those, it's Bitcoin blockchain is then filled with BRC20 tokens. It's all filled with text now it also makes the creator of Ornos really sad because he's an artist and he likes to do all the fun things and he wants to inscribe things on, on Bitcoin. And now it's filled with all this like boring uh, JSON things on Bitcoin, whereas it's just people minting BRC20 tokens, kind of speculating it, kind of like degen into it. That's like the term that, that the, the community is using, where you just hope that this will take off in a big way and you will make a lot of good money with it. But I mean, most of that will be will not worth anything anyway. But it's such a badly designed token. But it will, but all this doesn't matter because as protocols start to being used, more stuff will be get, get built around it. And also more, um, there are more upcoming protocols that will kind of try to improve on it or replace it or, or, um, or build tools around to make it easier to build on. So the one thing I want to touch on with the social consensus, which is literally on the white space of Bitcoin. So, if Bitcoin doesn't support smart contract, how do you build all this thing on Bitcoin? So if, you, if you're in a blockchain space, you always see people ask about like, what is the consensus of your blockchain? So if you create a new blockchain, I, I, I've did that a few times. Uh, so natural people, I, the question I get is like, what's the consensus of your blockchain? For me, it's like, what, what do you mean by that? The consensus, what do you mean by that? So I don't quite know how to answer that, but once I kind of, understand what they want, they kind of like really, under, they really want, a, is it a proof of work, is it a proof of stake, is it a proof, proof of whatever, but these are actually not consensus. These are basically just a way to distribute the tokens. It's not a consensus. Consensus is the rule that sets on, a, the, on the note itself, like if you see, if it breaks that, it should not be a valid transaction. That's a consensus. So these are actually not it. 
But I want to talk about social consensus. So social consensus is literally this traffic light. So if you if you drive a car today, and uh, okay, it be so a hard consensus like a Bitcoin protocol or Ethereum is that if your transaction is invalid, it will be discarded. If it's valid, it will be passed along. And if you drive a car today and you know if you see a green light, you're gonna move. If you see a red light, you're gonna stop. But is it a hard consensus of your car that it sees a red light, you have, to, you, you have to stop? It's not a hard consensus because if you see a red light, you can still step on your gas and you can still go. So it's a social consensus. Obviously, there's law behind it, but social consensus, if you see a red light, you should stop. It's a commonly accepted social consensus that you follow this rule. So this is what happened on Bitcoin today on all this meta protocol that's been built on Bitcoin where it's unlike Ethereum where these things are hard consensus. If you start a program, it has to compile, it has to run in a, in a predictable way. Whereas if you use a white space, you, do, you throw anything you want in the white space, people that parses it will agree that that's the way to parse it. People that don't will just ignore it because it's just white space, it's just whatever they put in there. You can put in your, your comment, you can put in your marriage cert or anything you want in there, it's just, it's just being ignored. So this is what is known as social consensus. And this is actually what Ornos is. It's actually a made up rule on the Bitcoin blockchain that a group of enthusiasts agree to. So you can see that it's actually returned with a false already. So it's like all these things are actually not ignored. And it's false. So the actual Bitcoin miner is already ignoring the, the consensus that goes behind this. And then these are the kind of like the made up rule. Like if you see false, if you see if, if you see odd, it's, it's not literally meant to be that. It's just if you see these things, then you know that the next thing that, that you expect is a mime type of what the payload is. And this is what Onno's inscription is all about. It's just a white space that Bitcoin miners do not completely ignore. And, and, and it's filled, and now the Bitcoin blockchain is all filled with this. And every single Bitcoin block uh, has been filled um, I think 70, 80% with uh, things like this. So Bitcoin miners are now mining a lot of garbage because to them, like, I don't care about this. And this is a clean example. An actual example would be JPEG. So you can, you're going to see like uh, uh, serialized uh, ASCII um, um, binary uh, that gonna be done, that, that's going to go in there. So it's, uh, it's, this is what a made up rule is. So for all nodes client, you're going to see this. You're going to then say, OK, this is an all node. And this is what you say, hello world. And you see one that says, uh, JPEG, then you're going to take all this thing and then you kind of unserialize it and then build a binary around it and that's JPEG and you render it on your, on your site. So most Bitcoin clients do not care and Arnold's client will care. So this is a made up rule on, uh, on Arnold's side. So this BRC20 also same thing, you're going to build on top of that. And this is what's happening on Bitcoin today. So you can have three layers. So you have fungible layer on Bitcoin and then you have non-fungible layer which is Arnold's and then you have another layer which is, called, which is BRC20 that's fungible. So it feels, it feels really shitty. Like, why do you have to go through three different layers to do something? Because you can actually just build, you can just actually just build over here for like fungible layer on BRC20 if you want to. Why do you have to go through these layers? It feels like it, it's done in a really bad way. Not only that, it's also done in a really bad way. That it, it's susceptible to double spend. You have to rely on external indexer to, to do all the, um, all the checkings and all of that. So it's, it's really bad. But, um, yeah, so there are other competing token standards as well, including uh, Casey himself came up with a new standard because he's just, he just got so um, upset with the whole BRC20 thing taken off. So he wrote a new standard now that actually prevents double spend and adheres more to the UTXO model of, of Bitcoin. So it's still being worked on. It's just an idea. It's still being worked on. And other community members have come up with new things now to improve on the shitty uh, BRC20 thing that's... Uh, that's uh, really, really bad. But it's kind of like the, the one that takes off. But I'm pretty sure runes from KC will then eventually take it over because firstly, he created Arnold's and secondly, he just got crowds that, that use it, right? So it's, it's a social thing. Um, yeah, so how do you feel right now? It feels like a mess where you have a fungible layer, you have non-fungible layer, you have fungible layer that's on top of that. And, and it, like, you have to have so many different layers of parser to understand what's, what all these things going on. And, and I just want to compare it with, with this, right? So if you're in computer science in high school, you're going you're to know this or OSI model where you have all these different layers, seven layers of things where it 
makes your internet work stay and you kind of even forget about it, how it works. So you go from layer one physical layer all the way to the application layer. So, so layer one physical layer, that's literally the wire that connects the, the transmit, the, uh, connects all the ports and all the wires and around, around the, uh, your house and around your schools and all that. So that one actually determines how you would then send um, the, the electric signal over to that. And then you have transport layer, TCP and UDP, where I actually literally deal with. So, and then you have uh, HTTP, which is on top of that. Um, so the thing that I want to say here is that every single layer kind of only care about whether it's correct on that layer. And if, it, if it's not correct on that layer, it discards it. So for instance, at layer four, uh, transport layer, if it's, a, if it's not a valid TCP or UDP packet, it's going to discard it. If it's a valid one, doesn't care if it's a valid HTTP or not, it's going to pass it along and then get passed by the layer on top of that. So you can kind of see the, the similarity to what's happening in Bitcoin today, where it's very different on Ethereum. On Ethereum, everything is consensus. But on Bitcoin, you can have this different layer. So, so what we're seeing right now on Bitcoin side is similar to this, right? So Bitcoin is sitting on the application layer, and then you have Arnold that's sitting on top of that. So Bitcoin will only care about Bitcoin transactions. Anything that's above that, anything that's in that white space itself, will be ignored, but it's still a valid Bitcoin transaction, therefore you should still pass along. And then Arnold will then see, is this a valid Arnold transaction? If it's not, it doesn't, if it doesn't fulfill the, the, the envelope that, that kind of encapsulate the whole payload, if it doesn't fulfill that, then it will ignore, it will just discard it. If it's, if it's a valid one, then it just index it and then pass it along. And then BRC20 indexer will then see, is this a valid transaction if, or is it not? If it's not, for instance, like someone sends more token than he actually has, even though it's a valid or no transaction, but it's not a valid BRC20 transaction, it will then discard. So you can build layers on top of that. So it feels like you're building on something that's not too incomplete, but you're using that white space to build layers that then eventually get indexed and then get eventually become a kind of a protocol that you can rely on to. So it's a matter of time where it will get easier to build on Arnold. It will get easier to build on BLC20 because you're relying on all these APIs and all these clients even that you can, you can reliably parse and index on your own. So you have to rely on checking against a centralized server. But over time, it will get there, even though it's a shitty protocol, but it will get there. So in more tools and SDKs, uh, it will get there. And current to build and contribute. So as part of our process in building OddsR, we also contribute to the space uh, by having SDKs to make it easier to build. Um, also providing uh, protocols as well to make tradings easy, make all it open source and rewrite uh, proposals as well. Um, yeah, so Bitcoin development is back. Uh, for me, I'm really excited about that because I'm a core Bitcoiner. Uh, I got into Ethereum for a while and now Bitcoin is back again. But the cool thing about, about Bitcoin being non-consensus, all this meta protocol that are non-consensus, meaning that you can actually do anything you want and then you try to build followings around that, try to build tools around that. That makes it really fun because it's kind of like early days of Ethereum all over again. And there will be competing meta protocols just like there are so many different protocols that you have on the Ethereum internet protocol. And eventually one of them will, or one or two of them will eventually become the, the, the norm, right? You can see that today, no one uses FTP anymore, no one uses Archie anymore, uh, no one uses Archie anymore, no one uses Telnet anymore because the, the one that kind of matures will then win, right? So it's kind of like, we're in a mess right now on Bitcoin meta protocols, but eventually it will, there will be some, some uh, emerging one that will then eventually win. So this is what it is. So, this is my last slide, I'm gonna end with this. So scarcity for, for crypto, especially for Bitcoin, a lot of people like to think that scarcity for, for, for Bitcoin, it's about the coin itself, it's about the currency itself. So that's why people speculate on, on Bitcoin and all of that. But the scarcity of Bitcoin is actually not the, not the coin itself, it's actually the block, the block space, because it's a white space. It's a global database that every, like anyone has it. And if you inscribe something on Bitcoin blockchain, you're gonna know that it's gonna be there forever, like longer than your, your own uh, lifetime. And it's the single most biggest uh, monument that mankind has ever built because of so much work that goes into that, into building that all the hash and all that builds into this crazy monument in there. So it's the scarcity of Bitcoin blockchain itself. It's the block, the limited block space that you have and everyone's competing 
to get something in there. You can get a picture of your kids in there. You can you can get your crypto documents in there. You can have like your like really secure file. You can encrypt it and put it in there. It's going to be there forever and ever. So this is going to be really really expensive and really really scarce. So the 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 limit of blockchain is of Bitcoin blockchain. And with that, I'm going to, uh, that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you so much. Any questions?